Okay, we're uh, in class two of the book of Hebrews and our study, and we're doing just these little short 20 minute, 15 to 20 minute studies and walking through the book of Hebrews. As I said last time, uh, it's just such a fantastic book and it's a call to faith. And it's not only a call to faith, but it's also, uh, it builds up our faith because it helps us to, to focus our eyes on Jesus, to focus our hearts, our minds, uh, interesting thing, there's 12 different scriptures about setting our hearts and not letting our hearts harden. Um, and, you know, we're called to set our minds, to set our eyes, to set our heart. And, I, you know, having been a Christian myself 37 years, um, I'm realizing more and more how important it is that I be good at that, that I be good at focusing my heart, focusing my mind on Jesus. And what does that mean? What does it mean to walk all day long with Jesus in mind or being mindful of God's presence and of the Holy Spirit. And these are the things I'm learning right now to do. And it's very exciting to me. And the book of Hebrews is basically key to that. You know, it's 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 it's, it's an exercise, a spiritual exercise in, in being aware of God, being aware of Jesus, of who he is, what he is. And and um, walking with him all day long. So uh, I gave the background last time, and that was just a quick background. You know, you want more in depth, read the book. It's got, it's got a lot more depth in it. Um, but uh, we're gonna go ahead and jump right into the scripture. But uh, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and say a prayer, a, a quick prayer, just to, to get ourselves ready. Because I think anytime that we approach the scriptures, we need to have the right mindset, the right heart set about it. So uh, let's let's go ahead and pray. Father God, uh, please uh, bless this time that we have to jump into your word and study. God, help us to grow from it. Help us to learn. I pray that we'll have such humble hearts and open minds that you can transform us, that you can change us, that you can help us become what you want us to be. Uh, Father, help us to not just uh, read it and it bounce off our hearts, but it be able to really penetrate into our hearts and change us, God. Help it to set our minds. Help us to be able to be easily led by the Holy Spirit in our thinking and even in our emotions. Uh, I pray, God, that your will be done. Father, please bless our study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, one of the, one of the keys about of knowing if, if you're reading the Bible well and you're studying well, as we, especially when you get into deeper study, is that it should be humbling. <laughs> it shouldn't be just adding knowledge, which what does what? It puffs up, right? So it's, it, it should actually be humbling as we learn more scriptures, we grow deeper in, in the scriptures. So we're, we're going to jump into the book of Hebrews. I'm going to come right out of uh, right out of the scriptures. Um, the first paragraph is just, it's a beautiful paragraph. It's, um, the, the Greek is eloquent. It's, it's, it's beautifully written. It's almost poetic. If you hear it read in Greek, it's very pretty. It just, uh, I think, I think there's like seven words that start with the letter P and, and, uh, absolutely a work of art, uh, not just, information being transferred to us but even in even in in the english it's still uh it's still it's still a beautiful calling so i'm going to read the first paragraph in the past god spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. So uh, right away, you know, you, you pick up that word superior, superior, and, and you're going to hear that a lot because, as I said last time, that's a major theme in, in this book. Um, so we start out with the very first sentence. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. 
And, you know, literally he, he, he's painting the picture, or she, <laughs> painting the picture of, of that, you know, God has spoken to us in many different ways. We have the, the, the minor prophets, the major prophets. And it's, it's amazing because each of the prophets gives us kind of a window into God's heart present something. If you're talking about Hosea and redeeming love, or you're talking about Micah and righteousness and mercy for the, the poor, or or Daniel and the God of nations and the power of nations, or uh, any, each, each prophet kind of gives us a different view of God. And yet he's telling us that now God is speaking through, through his son. He's not giving us a view uh, one of my favorite analogies, uh, William Barclay, if you read Barclay's commentaries, he, he talks about um, that every, every prophet, I think he says there is like a key on the piano keyboard, yet Jesus is the entire keyboard. Jesus is the whole thing. Likewise, I would say that, that every prophet is like a, a, a musician in an orchestra. You have the violinist, you have the piano, you have the, the brass section, you have the, 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 you know, the, the trumpets, uh, the strings, and yet Jesus is all of it as it comes together. Jesus is the full image of God. He's not just showing us an aspect of God or a characteristic of God. He is showing us God. I mean, it's, this is what, what John writes at the beginning. No one has ever seen God except him, right? The one and only, right? He, he shows us. If you have seen Jesus, you have seen God. And he says, in the past, he spoke through all of them, but now he speaks directly through his son. You know, if you were renting a house and you got letters from the, from the management company, that's one thing. But if the son of the owner shows up or the daughter of the owner shows up and says, look, we're going to need this or that, that's a whole nother level of seriousness, right? This is direct information, direct contact. And he says, uh, in the last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Now, the people say, well, what do you mean the last days? Are we in the last days? Absolutely, we're in the last days. The last days started when Jesus was crucified, right? Or they started when Jesus came to earth and began the, the, his, his ministry, which this is the last days, the ministry of reconciliation, the ministry of calling us back to God and reconciling us to be with him. Um, he says, in the last days, he has spoken to us by his son. And this is important because, you know, there will be a day where there's no more Bible studies. There, there's no more baptizing people. There's no more helping people to find redemption. There's no more finding forgiveness for sins. There will be a time when it's done. It's over. It'll be judgment day. Everybody must give an account for their lives. But fortunately... At least today, at this moment, we're not there yet. So there's still time to have all sins forgiven. There's still time to have uh, to deal with anything that we have done in life, to find God's forgiveness, to find God's grace. And all that was brought to us through his son, Jesus. So, so he says, um, but in the last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. And, and as I said earlier, you know, the, the, the writer comes out swinging here, letting us know who is Jesus, is the heir of all things. You know, that's a big deal, especially in ancient times or tr any traditional culture. The firstborn gets everything, right? If you, there's eight kids in your family, who's going to get the title? Who's going to get the house? Who's going to get the wealth? It's the firstborn. And, and this is God's firstborn. This is Jesus. He gets it all. You get Jesus. You get it all. Um, there's a there's a classic story that I love to tell of a, of a of a man who with uh, who w did very well in life. His business prospered. He made lots of money. He had a beautiful home. He had a beautiful wife, and and um, just really life was very good. And and uh, his wife became pregnant and they were so excited they were going to have a boy and uh, they had their little boy beautiful little boy but tragedy struck when the boy was born his wife died and and it was all he had was his little boy the man never remarried he never had any more children but 
He loved his, his, his son. And his son was just the joy of his life. And he always made sure to spend time with him, meet all his needs. But uh, unfortunately, uh, tragedy struck again. And his son uh, became ill and, and passed away. And all he had was this painting of his son. So the man never remarried, never had any more children. Uh, you know, lived the rest of his life building his 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 business empire, making lots of money, and uh, as life you know would would have it, he in an older as an older man he passed away. So having no heirs, having uh, no nobody to give it to, no family, his estate went up for sale. So they had a big huge auction and. And lots of people came because the man collected a lot of fine art and had many things of value. And um, on the day of the auction, the auctioneer opened it up and he started with the painting of the sun. And, uh, you know, the painting went up there and he said, who'll start the bidding at $1,000? And nobody, nobody raised their hand. Nobody made a sign. He said, uh, $500, nobody. $100, nobody. $50, $50, and a little old man in the back in the corner of the room, who was actually the gardener, raised his hand. And uh, the gardener knew the son well. They used to play together outside. He used to play with the son. He loved the son. And uh, he would play with him. And so nobody else bid. So the, the auctioneer said, okay, anybody, you know, we're going once, going twice, and boom. He said he sold to the, to the man in the back. And uh, then he took the book, which had the list of all the items, all the statues, the cars, the house, the furniture, the paintings, everything. And he closed the book. And he said, that concludes the auction for today. And everybody's, what, what, what? You know, they all came to to buy things. And he said, uh, it was stated clearly in the will that whoever gets the sun gets everything. And so the gardener got everything. That's the way it is. You get Jesus. You get everything. He's the heir of everything. Everything comes to us through Jesus. He said, The Son whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. And I love this because it's almost a side comment. And and by the way, he made the universe. (laughs) You know, it's not just like, like he's a pretty powerful prophet. No, no, he made the universe. (laughs) Everything that has been made is made through him. And the sun is the radiance of God's glory. The the, the Greek word, I love the Greek word, is apagasma, the the holiness, the radiance, the glow of God. That's the sun. That's who Jesus is. He is God's glory. Son is the apagasma of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. The, 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 again, the, the, the word in Greek, character, the character of his being. And a character, like if you take a coin, if you take a quarter, there's a character inscribed on it. And you look at that character and you know, we all know who the quarter is, right? The, the, we know it's George Washington. We would be able to recognize George Washington because all, we've all seen quarters so many times, right? We all know who's on a penny. We recognize that. If, if Abraham Lincoln was walking down the street, we'd all know, even though none of us were alive back then, because we know the character. We know the image, right? We recognize him. Jesus is the character, the exact representation of God, He represents God exactly, his being, his essence, who he is. People want to say, oh, no, no, he's not God, that's blasphemy. No man is God. and You you can't make it any clearer than this. It's his exact representation. There are large religious groups, even that so-called Christian groups that teach Jesus is not God. It doesn't get any plan. He's the exact, how close is he? Exact representation. He's exactly him. The representation of God. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. You know, everything is sustained. What does it sustain? It means it's 
held together. It's, it's held up. It keeps going. It's, it's, you think about the light that's shining on me. That light is sustained. The power of that light comes from the power of his word, which is Jesus. Jesus is the word of God. That the, 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 the energy necessary for my heart to beat so I can be here talking to you comes from Jesus. The energy that expands my lungs and allows me to breathe or jump in a car and drive. What Everything comes from him. All power comes from him. The lightning in the sky, the electricity uh, that lights up our room. Everything comes from him. All things come from him. And it says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of being, sustaining all things by his powerful word, the logos, the word of God. After he had provided the purifications for sins, you know, after he paid the price. And by the way, he paid for your sins. And this is really important, especially in the Hebrew mindset, because because when somebody does for you, you owe them. And that's understood. That's the debt of love. That's hesed. That's, That's the pact. That's the new covenant that Jesus gave his life for us. And therefore, we should give our lives... To him, he says, he says, after he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. You know, the, again, it's almost a side comment. After he did this incredible thing, paying for all your sins, and especially for a Hebrew Christian, he, they understand how incredibly valuable this is. What is the num- number one problem of mankind? It's sin. What is the number one problem that all people have is that sin separates us from God. And Jesus dealt with that. He provided purification from sins. He paid for them. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And that right hand, or the right, the right spot, was always the place of honor sitting next to the king. That somebody of high honor, probably the highest in the land, would be the one that was allowed to sit to the right of the of the king. And it says, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. He's he's far superior. Now the angels, the angeloi, um, or the malachim, the the messengers of God, uh, that's a big deal. And, and, and generally, most of these things mentioned, they, know, they knew a lot more. And remember, I talked about the primary listeners and then the general audience. The primary listeners here knew a lot more about all these details that he was talking about that. You know, you think about um, being in the presence of God. That's, that's a huge thing. When the, when, the Hebrew, when, the, when the Hebrews were led out of Egypt... They didn't want to be too close to God. They got to the edge of the mountain, and you remember God was showing his glory. There was there was thunder and trumpets and blasts, and, and they got scared. They were like, no, 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 you, Moses, you go up there. You know, and, and then they had, when they built the tabernacle, they had the holy, the holy of holies, same thing with the temple. And in the holy of holies, where God's spirit would reside, only one person, the high priest, once a year was allowed to go in there. And, and there's an old story, it's a fable, and I don't, I don't really know if it's true or not, but it's a great story, that when the high priest would go in that room, they would literally put a chain around his ankle so that if for some reason he were to look at God and die, because surely he would die, nobody had to go in after him. They could just pull him out by the chain because everybody knew to see God in his glory, and he was so holy and so incredible, was what could you could literally die. That's how intense it is to be in the presence of God. And yet the angels were in the presence of God day and night, 24 hours, seven days a week. That's how awesome they are. That's how powerful they are. It was one angel that led the Hebrews out of Egypt and protected them against the armies. One angel and, and, and could destroy thousands. And Jesus was superior to them, superior to the angels, greater than they are. And he goes into an argument 
uh, he lays out an argument. He says, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father. And and by the way, this is, this is a weaving of scriptures here. There's multiple scriptures being quoted. Psalm 2, 7 there. Uh, I will be his son and he will be my father. Uh, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. You know, now, now even this statement alone, that angels would worship a being. Who would they worship other than God? Only God. And, and clearly the, the argument is being laid out that not only is he superior to the angels, he is God. Every Hebrew, every Jew knew you only worship God. You don't worship anybody. You don't worship people. Only God. And, he's, and he says, let all God's angels worship him. And speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. Okay, that's Psalms 104. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever, and the scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved the righteous and hated the wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, he has set you above your companions by anointing you with joy. He also says, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. He's quoting Psalm 8, 6 and, and Zechariah 12, 1. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. And he's weaving all these different scriptures together to make it clear who is God. To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to those who, who will inherit salvation. You know, and he reminds us that the, the angels are actually here to, to serve and to help us. But Jesus is far superior to, to all of them. So, so just chapter one alone, he lays it out. He establishes how awesome is Jesus. He's not just a man. He's not just a prophet. Muhammad, Buddha, Siddhartha, you know, all of them, we know where, they, where they're buried. But Jesus, the tomb's empty because he rose from the dead. Why? Because he wasn't just a man. He was the apogosma of God. He was the exact character of God. He is the being of God, sustaining all things through the power of his word. So that's chapter one, and we'll just stop right there.